There is not one thing that has ever happened to you. Not one experience, not one encounter, not one crisis, not one joyful thing that hasn't happened just to make you better and help you rise. I want to leave you, hopefully, with something that you can take home that not only empowers, but emboldens you to live the life that God intended. Because this is what people don't know, because you can't tell everybody. I am who I am. One black woman, my hand in God's hand, trusting in that word, because that word never failed me. And I got to where I am and I stand as I am, as Maya Angelou often says and often said and says in her poem to our grandmothers, every time you see me, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Every time you see me, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So it's just not me standing up here. It's every, it's my mother, my grandmother, her mother, the mother before her, her grandfather, every uncle who prayed, every sister who cried, every aunt who sacrificed, those whose names made the history books, those whose names never could make the history books, who allowed me to come as one and stand as 10,000. I stand and sit at the boards as one but I'm bringing the 10,000 behind me because I not only know who I am, but I also know whose I am. And so anything you hear about me that feels good, sounds good, you think about, it, I wonder what Oprah's doing, how she's doing. I, I am living the dream. And I want you to live the dream because I'm not living the dream because I'm special. I'm living the dream because I was obedient to the call of the dream. So I want you to leave here today thinking about what is the dream for you? What is God's dream for you? What does the creator's dream hold for you? So often we spend our lives wishing and hoping and hoping and wishing and desiring things. This is what I know for sure. You don't get what you wish for. You don't even get what you hope for. You get what you believe. So what is it you believe and know to be God's dream for you? So I live in the dream. I'm living in the space of the dream. And dream's good, dream's good. The dream is greater than anything that I could have imagined. When I first came to Baltimore, I, I, I made friends with a wonderful woman named Arlene Weiner. She was the wealthiest person I'd ever met. And I went to her house and parked in the driveway. There was a Corvette and there was a BMW and there was a Mercedes. I went, whoa, Arlene's rich. And at Arlene's house, once I got inside, I could see from her kitchen window six trees in the front yard. I thought, oh, rich people have trees. When I get rich, I'm going to get me some trees. I'm not just going to get me. Everybody want to get cars and pocketbooks and shoes. But I want me some trees. So as life would have it, I was standing in my kitchen window about three years ago in California, making coffee in the morning. And I was looking out the window and I saw the six trees. But listen to me. I was making, making, making the coffee. I saw the six trees. I went out on the porch to actually count the six trees. And this is what I noticed. That I could dream the six. But beyond the six trees in my kitchen window are 3,687 trees. How do I know? Because I had them counted. I had them counted. So I said, I want to know how many trees out there. I dreamed the six. That's as much as my, 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 my small mind and my imagination could hold for myself. I dreamed the six. 
but God can see beyond the six. Can see beyond the six because there was a bigger dream for me. And I'm here to tell you there is a bigger dream for you, Essence. There's a bigger dream. And so the key, the secret, the magic is to surrender to God's dream for you. To quit fighting against and pushing against and disallowing against and resisting against and trying to tell the creator, the universal forces, divine intelligence, what you are supposed to do and get still and know for sure what his dream, the dream is for you. But at the end of the poem, there is the stanza that says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now my little eight-year-old brain didn't really fully understand the power and depth of those words, but they sounded good enough for me to write them down and put them on my mirror. And those words, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, became a mantra for me. What it said is, I am responsible for the choices that I make in my life. I am responsible. I am responsible. The third law of motion in physics says, for every action, it's called Newton's law, and it says for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So what does that mean? That means everything that you are putting out into the world, every action, bam, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It means no matter what you do, the energy of what you do, what you say, and most important, the energy of who you are is going out into the world, into your home, into your relationships, and that energy is always coming back to you. You are responsible for the energy that you are pulling out into the world because that very energy, bam, is coming right back to you every single time, whether you believe it or not, because it is law. It is law. It is law that what you put out into the world is coming back. to do is already done so when I figured that out oh what I'm putting out is what's coming back let me get real clear about what it is I'm putting out real clear so I read a book about 1989 called seed of the soul and in that book Gary Zukav talked about the laws of karma of the laws of cause and effect the third law of motion and in that book he talked about how intention your intention is always one with the law meaning before you even think about a thing you have an intention for the thing and that the intention is going to determine the outcome intention with which you give, the intention with which you serve, determines the outcome. So when I figured that out, I went, whoa, I changed everything I did on my show. I called in the producers and I said, from this day forward, I will no longer be speaking to the KKK. I will no longer be speaking to people who are fighting each other in a way that it is damaging to the character of myself and other people who watch. From this day forward, I am only going to do intentional television. The 
reason we remain number one for 25 straight years is because every single day I would have a pre-show meeting and have the producers come in and state to me what is your intention? How do we want to use whoever is on this show? Whatever is happening on this show to serve the audience in a way that fulfills the mission of uplifting, enlightening, encouraging, as well as entertaining. And if it doesn't do that, then I can't do it. I can't put my name on it. I don't do anything. And I ask that you consider not doing anything that you don't truly intend. Do not allow yourself to be marginalized and defined by other people's agendas and intentions because the power of your story lies in your personal intention. So it is my intention, my intention to fulfill the dream of the creator. It is my intention to live to the highest calling and be pressed to the mark of the highest calling that I have come to do. And when you can ask the creator, ask that which made you you, what is your dream for me? I guarantee you, instead of you trying to define the dream, what is your dream for me? If you're able to lean into the dream that the universe and all the forces of, 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 of light and love and power and grace by all the names that we call God has for you, nobody can touch you. Nobody can touch you. Everybody works hard and everybody has their own dreams. There is, there was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things, wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice. I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. But no matter what challenges or setbacks or disappointments you may encounter along the way, you will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself as a human being. You want to max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. From time to time, you may stumble, fall. You will for sure count on this. No doubt, you will have questions and you will have doubts about your path but I know this if you're willing to listen to be guided by that still small voice that is the GPS within yourself to find out what makes you come alive you will be more than okay you will be happy you will be successful and you will make a difference in the world I know this, that many of the things that have happened to you have also happened for you. You get to decide 
whether or not you choose to be happier or not. And it's not the circumstances. I've never had a therapist, but I had so many therapists on the show. I got my therapy from the Oprah show and I learned so much. So when I first started having conversations with families from, you know, different walks of life, that's when I came to understand that there is a common bond that we all share, that we're all really seeking the same things. And knowing that that thing was happiness came from the show. 10 years in, the audience became my focus group. I would always ask people, what do you want? What would it take to make you happy? And most people, when I say, what do you want? They just say, I just want to be happy. Tell me what that looks like. And as the years progressed, women were more able to identify what that specifically was. But when I first started asking that question in the mid 90s, they would always just say, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Well, what does that look like? And then they'd say, well, I want my kids to be happy. Well, that's your kids, but what do you want? And so being able to answer specifically what that looks like for you is the beginning of being happier. None of us can be happy all the time, but I will say that I have reached a level of enjoyment, contentment, satisfaction, and purpose that I'm pretty much happy all the time, even though I have negative feelings. Being able to identify your negative feeling versus believing that that is a constant state of mind for you or happiness or unhappiness. So the fact that I have a bad emotion or bad feelings, but can absorb those feelings and then change them. I, coming from where I've come from, rural Mississippi, never imagining the life that I have, for a long time, I have felt that I had enough, even though I kept getting more. But inside myself, I feel that I am enough, which is one of the great lessons. What is at the root of most people's dysfunction is that you don't think that you're good enough. You don't think that you're worthy. You don't own your own essence and your own power. I know this, that many of the things that have happened to you have also happened for you. And that I learned when the crisis or the challenge showed up for me, I immediately would ask, what is this here to teach me? And how can I get that lesson as soon as possible? And this I guarantee you, the moment you have the conscious realization of, oh, this is why this is here, showing up to allow me to see whatever that is in your life, it changes for you. Mm -hmm. So you have a feeling of anger, you have a feeling of sadness, you have a feeling of disappointment. Does it mean you are those things, you are those emotions? And so now what am I going to do now that I'm feeling disappointed about a certain thing? I am the kind of person, as you know, that believes that life is better when you share it, whether that's bread or information. The thing that I learned mostly is that we are con in control of our happiness and happierness. You get to decide whether or not you choose to be happier or not, and it's not the circumstances. Because that's what I've been trying to do my entire career, is help people see the fullness of themselves. However, we can spread the word that your happiness, your happierness is going to be up to you and it's up to you 
to be the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, and most importantly, the master of your happiness. No matter what, I'm going to be okay. No matter what, I can be in control of how I choose to react regardless of the circumstance. I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And I want to tell you, I've been guided by the light of God's grace my entire life. People ask, what's the secret to my success? It's because I lean into His grace. And this is what I do know. When you tap into what it's trying to tell you, when you can get yourself quiet enough to listen, I mean really listen, you can begin to distill the still small voice, which is always representing the truth of you, from the noise of the world and you can start to recognize when it comes your way you can learn to make distinctions to connect to dig a little deeper you'll be able to find your own voice within the still small voice you'll begin to know your own heart and figure out what matters most when you can listen to the still small voice Every right move I've made has come from listening deeply and following that still, small voice. Aligning myself with its power, with the source of power. And when I walk into that room, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Because everybody that's ever come before me walks into that room with me. My great-great-grandfather, Constantine Winfrey, born an enslaved man and couldn't write or smell his, spell his name, but 10 years after the Emancipation Proclamation had learned to read and had picked 10,000 bales of cotton in exchange for 80 acres of land and became the first person in my American lineage to own his own property. And at no time did I ever feel out of place or not enough or inadequate or an imposter. Do not let the world make an imposter syndrome out of you. Why? Because I knew who I was. And more importantly, I knew whose I was. But I knew who was in charge of the future. And my job, just as your job is, to align with God's dream for you. And my prayer was always, use me. Use me, God. Show me how and who you need me to be. Because this is what I will tell you. God can dream a bigger dream for you than you could ever imagine for yourself. I am living testimony of aligning and living his dream. There will never be anything in your life as fulfilling as making a difference in somebody else's. Everybody here wants to see you take your integrity, your curiosity, your creativity, your guts, and this newfound education of yours, and use it to make a difference. We start by being good to at least one other person every single day. Just extend yourself in love and kindness to somebody and as my dear friend Maya always said love recognizes no barriers it jumps hurdles it leaps fences it penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope and when you step out in love you become someone's hope and I know that becoming hope in the world won't always be easy there'll be times when you get to your wits end but there's another old proverb that says when you get to your wits end remember that's where god lives we need you to dream big we need audacious thinkers we also need generosity of spirit we need high standards and open minds and untamed imagination that's how you make a difference in the world using who you are 
and what you stand for to make changes big and small. And there will be times when making the next right decision will be scary. I'll tell you a secret. That's how I've gotten through every challenge without being overwhelmed, by asking what is the next right move. You don't have to know all the right moves. You just need to know the next one. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Let your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Anything is possible. The wheels are still in spin. Saints walk among us. And as Nelson Mandela so brilliantly demonstrated, it's better to be hopeful than fearful, if for no other reason than the fact that hope brings us one step closer to joy. And I leave you with this. You have been prayed for and paid for. Not just tuition, but paid for through the sacrifices, through the daily aggressions, through the discriminations, the locked doors, the back doors, the barriers broken down, through the humiliations, working two and three jobs just trying to make ends meet and getting you a little money so you can have something to spend in college. Every family member from generations back who helped make this day possible, you owe them a rising. And your job is to come on up to the rising, to meet the rising of your life, and know that your crown has been paid for. And the secret I've learned to getting ahead is being open to the lessons. Lessons from the grandest universe of all, that is, the universe itself. It's being able to walk through life eager and open to self-improvement and that which is going to best help you evolve, because that's really why we're here, to evolve as human beings. So, to grow into being more of ourselves, always moving to the next level of understanding, the next level of compassion and growth. I think the great, one of the greatest compliments I've ever received, I interviewed with a reporter when I was first starting out in Chicago, and then many years later I saw the same reporter and she said to me, you know what, you really haven't changed. You've just become more of yourself. And that is really what we're all trying to do, become more of ourselves. And I believe that there is a lesson in almost everything that you do in every experience, and getting the lesson is how you move forward. It's how you enrich your spirit. When you're supposed to do something or not supposed to do something, your emotional guidance system lets you know. The trick, trick is to learn to check your ego at the door and start checking your gut instead. Every right decision I've made, every right decision I've ever made has come from my gut. And every wrong decision I've ever made was a result of me not listening to the greater voice of myself. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. That's the lesson. And that lesson alone will save you, my friends, a lot of grief. Dr. King said not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato or Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Trouble don't last always from that hymn, this too shall pass. And I thought, as I got out of the shower, I am gonna turn this thing around. 
and I will be better for it. And when I do, I'm going to go to Harvard and I'm going to speak the truth of it. So I'm here today to tell you, I have turned that network around. Know this, remember this, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us in another direction. Now, when you're down there in a the hole, it looks like failure. So this past year, I had to spoon feed those words to myself. And when you're down in the hole, when that moment comes, it's really okay to feel bad for a little while. Give yourself time to mourn what you think you may have lost. But then, here's the key. Learn from every mistake. Because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes are there to teach you and force you into being more of who you are. And then figure out what is the next right move. And the key to life is to develop an internal, moral, emotional GPS that can tell you which way to go. The challenge of life, I have found, is to build a resume that doesn't simply tell a story about what you want to be, but it's a story about who you want to be. It's a resume that doesn't just tell a story about what you want to accomplish, but why. A story that's not just a collection of titles and, and positions, but a story that's really about your purpose. Because when you inevitably stumble and find yourself stuck in a hole, that is the story that will get you out. What is your true calling? What is your dharma? What is your purpose? You really haven't changed. You've just become more of yourself. And that is really what we're all trying to do. Become more of ourselves. And I believe that there is a lesson in almost everything that you do in every experience. And getting the lesson is how you move forward. It's how you enrich your spirit. And trust me, I know that inner wisdom is more precious than wealth. The more you spend it, the more you gain. So today, I just want to share a few lessons, meaning three. The three lessons that have had the greatest impact on my life have to do with feelings, with failure, and with finding happiness. What I know now is that feelings are really your GPS system for life. When you're supposed to do something or not supposed to do something, your emotional guidance system lets you know. The trick, trick is to learn to check your ego at the door and start checking your gut instead. Every right decision I've made, every right decision I've ever made has come from my gut. And every wrong decision I've ever made was a result of me not listening to the greater voice of myself. If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. That's the lesson. And that lesson alone will save you, my friends, a lot of grief. When you don't know what to do, get still. Get very still until you do know what to do. And when you do get still and let your internal motivation be the driver, not only will your personal life improve, but you will gain a competitive edge in the working world as well. One of my gifts that I've had since I was a little girl growing up in Mississippi, being raised on a tiny little acre farm with my grandmother, is that I knew how to pay attention. I was a great observer of life. And I grew up believing that I was indeed for sure God's child. It's because every Sunday I sat in our little church 
down the road, a dirt road from where my grandmother lived. No running water, no electricity. I was saying this to my great niece who's eight the other day and she said, it sounds like Little House on the Prairie. No running water, no electricity, but the church is down the road from us. And we could hear the singing as I was getting dressed for Sunday school. And I'd always sit on the left hand side, the left pew in the second row. And I would listen to the preacher preach about the Lord thy God is a loving God. And sometimes he would say the Lord thy God is a jealous God. But most important, I heard him say, you are God's child. And through God, all things are possible. But what I now know and have learned that my view of God, although I call that God in a box and all that, although that has, ex my vision of God has expanded to be inclusive of all things, all, all. God is all, God is law, God is all, in all things. Not just the guy standing up in the, sitting up with the beard. And now that that view of God has expanded, I still understand how important it was for a little colored girl, we weren't even black yet, not to mention African American, you know what I mean, Harry. A little colored girl in Mississippi for whom there was no vision of hope or possibility, that something greater than me was in charge of my destiny, of my fate, that it wasn't just me alone having to survive for myself is the thing, is the value, is the rock that has sustained me. So my vision, my perception, my understanding of what it means to be a universal citizen has, has grown. As I came to understand Acts 17.28, my favorite Bible verse that says, in God I move and breathe and have my being. A spiritual being having a human experience come trailing the breath of the ancestors yet, but trailing the breath of the angels. And understanding that because I am connected to the source of all that is, all that is possible is possible for me. That's who I am. And what do I want? I don't want to just be successful in the world. The answer to that question for me is I want to fulfill the highest, truest expression of myself as a human being. I want to fulfill the promise that the Creator dreamed when He dreamed the cells that made up me. What do I want? You must have some kind of vision for your life. Even if you don't know the plan, you have to have a direction in which you choose to go. You must find a way to serve. Martin Luther King said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. The real truth is that service and significance, service and the significance that you bring to your service is that which is lasting. When you shift the paradigm of whatever it is you choose to do to service and you bring significance to that, success will, I promise you, follow you. Service and significance equals success. That's number two. Number three, it's so simple but so hard to do. Always do the right thing.
We want to be unforgettable and not forgettable. So doing the right thing, even when nobody knows you're doing the right thing, will always bring the right thing to you. I promise you that. Why? Because the third law of motion is always at work. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That is so true in all of our lives. You always know it's the right thing when in the end, there is peace. You are rewarded by peace in knowing that you did the right thing. All of you leaving here have the potential for enormous success. There's a price that comes with that. People don't always like you and they're not always happy for you. And if you surround yourself with people who are not accustomed to your success, they become fearful, they become scared because you are reflecting back something to them that they don't recognize. Who do I want to be in the world? My relationship to source energy, to all that is God. I'm not talking about what you believe in God. I'm talking about your experience of that which is all life, which is divine and universal. I'm talking about the big deal being connected and aligned with that. When you are tuned in and charged into that, whenever you feel empty, you go inside yourself and you connect to the source and you know that all things are possible. Knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. Being able to answer this question, who am I and what do I want? Do we have a destination? Is there a plan? Or are we just riding? What I've learned is that's a great metaphor for life. You want to be in the driver's seat of your own life because if you're not, life will drive you. So, knowing who you really are in this space and time that we embody. That's number one. What do you want? Who are you? Number two, you must find a way to serve. Martin Luther King said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. Now we live in a world where everybody wants to be famous and where we admire people for just being famous. We think being known brings us value. The real truth is that service and significance, service and the significance that you bring to your service is that which is lasting. So to be able to, whatever your occupation or job or talent or gift is, our honorees today, getting doctor degrees, to apparently opposite fields, HIV and AIDS and the spoken word. But what they have in common is service, using the spoken word in service to community and the world using your knowledge and information about HIV and AIDS and medicine in service to the world. And if you look at all the most successful people in the world, whether they know it or not, they have that paradigm of service. And made a decision that I was no longer going to just be on TV, but I was going to use TV as a platform as a force for good and not be used by TV. My decision 
to make that significant change in the way I operated on television, using television as a service, changed my career exponentially. When you shift the paradigm of whatever it is you choose to do to service and you bring significance to that, success will, I promise you, follow you. Service and significance equals success. That's number two. Number three, it's so simple, but so hard to do. Always do the right thing. Always be excellent. People notice. Let excellence be your brand. Everybody talks about building a brand. I never even knew what that was. When people would say, you're a brand, I would say, no, I'm just Oprah. What I recognize now is that my choice to in every way, in every example, in every experience, to do the right thing and the excellent thing is what has created the brand. Years ago, I did an ad for Revlon, for, uh, for uh, an ad uh, they were doing called unforgettable women. And what I know is that when you are excellent, you become unforgettable. People remember you, you stand out. Regardless of what it is, you become an unforgettable woman. And that is what we all want. We want to be unforgettable and not forgettable. So doing the right thing, even when nobody knows you're doing the right thing, will always bring the right thing to you. I promise you that. Why? Because the third law of motion is always at work. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That is so true in all of our lives. Everything you even try to do to me, already done to you. So you don't have to worry about revenge or getting back at somebody, making sure they pay. You just have to do the right thing and the right thing will follow you even when people don't support it. You do the right thing even when other people think it may not be. And oftentimes when you make a decision to do the right thing, immediately you're faced with doubt. Was that the right thing? Was that the right decision? I don't know, was that the right thing? You always know it's the right thing, when in the end, there is peace. You are rewarded by peace in knowing that you did the right thing. The most important thing I have come to know in doing the right thing and making the right choices is understanding what we talked about yesterday. All of you leaving here have the potential for enormous success. There's a price that comes with that. People don't always like you and they're not always happy for you. And if you surround yourself with people who are not accustomed to your success, they become fearful, they become scared because you are reflecting back something to them that they don't recognize. Now they're not gonna say, you know, I'm very fearful because you're reflecting back to me something I don't recognize. They're going to say, you know what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, who she thinks she is. Who she thinks she is. That only happens when you are around people who do not mean and want and aspire to the best for you. People who want the best for you want you to be your best. So my greatest advice to you is to surround yourself with people who are going to fill your cup until your cup runneth over. So when people say you're so full of yourself, you can say, yeah, yes, I'm full. 
I'm so full, my cup runneth over. And to know that once your cup runneth over, you cannot spend your life with your gallon size offerings, offering them to pint sized people. You have got to surround yourself with gallon sized people who can hang in the same company with you so that you're not offering your gallons to those little pipes out there who can't hold it anyway. And what I know for sure is that the biggest choices begin and end with you, your internal big questions. Who do I want to be in the world? My relationship to source energy, to all that is God. I'm not talking about what you believe in God. I'm talking about your experience of that which is all life, which is divine and universal. I'm talking about the big deal, being connected and aligned with that. When you are tuned in and charged into that, whenever you feel empty, you go inside yourself and you connect to the source and you know that all things are possible. So that even when the storms come, and they will, you'll know this too shall pass. This too shall pass. The storm is passing over and you shall not be moved because you know who you are. When you can do that, grace will follow you. Grace and glory. And when they see you coming, it ought to make them proud. At some point, you are bound to stumble because if you're constantly doing what we do, raising the bar, if you are constantly pushing yourself higher, higher, you will at some point fall. And when you do, I want you to know this, remember this, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us in another direction. Now, and when you're down in the hole, when that moment comes, it's really okay to feel bad for a little while. Give yourself time to mourn what you think you may have lost. But then, here's the key. Learn from every mistake. Because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes, are there to teach you and force you into being more of who you are. And then figure out what is the next right move. And the key to life is to develop an internal, moral, emotional GPS that can tell you which way to go. But the challenge of life, I have found, is to build a resume that doesn't simply tell a story about what you want to be but it's a story about who you want to be. It's a resume that doesn't just tell a story about what you want to accomplish, but why. A story that's not just a collection of titles and, and positions, but a story that's really about your purpose. Because when you inevitably stumble and find yourself stuck in a hole, that is the story that will get you out. What is your true calling? What is your dharma? What is your purpose? From time to time, you may stumble, fall. You will for sure count on this. No doubt, you will have questions and you will have doubts about your path. But I know this, if you're willing to listen, to be guided by that still small voice that is the GPS within yourself, to find out what makes you come alive, you will be more than okay. You will be happy, you will be successful, and you will make a difference in the world. Knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. 
being able to answer this question, who am I and what do I want? I'm asking the bigger question of who am I? Who am I really? My answer is I am God's child. And what do I want? I don't want to just be successful in the world. I don't want to just make a mark or have a legacy. The answer to that question for me is I want to fulfill the highest, truest expression of myself as a human being. I want to fulfill the promise that the Creator dreamed when He dreamed the cells that made up me. What do I want? You must have some kind of vision for your life. Even if you don't know the plan, you have to have a direction in which you choose to go. What I've learned is that's a great metaphor for life. You want to be in the driver's seat of your own life because if you're not, life will drive you. You must find a way to serve. Martin Luther King said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. Always do the right thing. Always. Be excellent. Be excellent. Let excellence be your brand. Everything you even try to do to me, already done to you. So you don't have to worry about revenge or getting back at somebody, making sure they pay. You just have to do the right thing and the right thing will follow you even when people don't support it. You do the right thing even when other people think it may not be. And oftentimes when you make a decision to do the right thing, immediately you're faced with doubt. Was that the right thing? Was that the right decision? I don't know, was that the right thing? You always know it's the right thing when in the end, there is peace. You are rewarded by peace in knowing that you did the right thing. People don't always like you and they're not always happy for you. And if you surround yourself with people who are not accustomed to your success, they become fearful, they become scared because you are reflecting back something to them that they don't recognize. They're going to say, you know what they're going to say. They're going to say, who she thinks she is. Who she thinks she is. That only happens when you are around people who do not mean and want and aspire to the best for you. People who want the best for you want you to be your best. So my greatest advice to you is to surround yourself with people who are going to fill your cup until your cup runneth over. So when people say you're so full of yourself, you can say, yeah, yes, I'm full. I'm so full, my cup runneth over. And to know that once your cup runneth over, you cannot spend your life with your gallon size offerings, offering them to pint sized people. You have got to surround yourself with gallon sized people who can hang in the same company with you so that you're not offering your gallons to those little pints out there who can't hold it anyway. And what I know for sure is that the biggest choices begin and end with you.
your internal big questions. Who do I want to be in the world? My relationship to source energy, to all that is God. I'm not talking about what you believe in God. I'm talking about your experience of that which is all life, which is divine and universal. I'm talking about the big deal, being connected and aligned with that. When you are tuned in and charged into that, whenever you feel empty, you go inside yourself and you connect to the source and you know that all things are possible. There is not one thing that has ever happened to you. Not one experience, not one encounter, not one crisis, not one joyful thing that hasn't happened just to make you better and help you rise.